seconds. <laughs> All right, hello everyone. Thank you uh, for attending. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at B-Sides Indy. Uh, topic today is fishing forensics. Is it just suspicious or is it malicious? And my name is Matt Shear. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at C3RKAH. Uh, slides will be posted uh, later on after the conference, um, but my slide decks are out there on slideshare.net slash circa. So a little bit about me. Uh, again, name is Matt Shear. I'm a systems security engineer with First Financial Bank uh, by day. Uh, also happen to be the chair for the Simpa Security SIG group in Cincinnati. Uh, so we're a monthly InfoSec meetup, sort of uh, uh, close to on par with uh, B-Sides. Uh, meet third Thursday of every month. Uh, if anybody's in the Cincinnati area, look us up. We're on meetup.com under um, Tech Life Cincinnati. So I've spoken at some other conferences and most recently B-Sides Columbus about eight days ago. Uh, I've got some certifications and uh, with that, I uh, just want to get this out of the way real quick. Um, so yes, I do have a day job. However, the opinions expressed are solely my own and do not express the views or opinions of my employer. And just a quick note about this. In fact, I've actually gone to um, sort of great lengths to not give everybody sort of what I have access to uh, in my day-to-day -day job, but things that anybody with internet connection will have access to. Uh, so I've tried to really generalize this um, and I still think everybody will get quite a bit out of it. And uh, there's uh, some amazing free tools and utilities out there we're gonna talk about. Um, so just a quick disclaimer. So this talk is very much a defensive blue kind of talk, but it absolutely bleeds red. Uh, I'm not gonna read this verbatim, but you should get the idea that you should only use this stuff, um, some of the things you're going to see in a real phishing campaign that's authorized. Uh, don't use this to send real world phishing campaigns out in the world. Uh, that would be frowned upon and I am not going to bail you out of jail. So let's begin. Um, situation that uh, we run across on our team is that we get a coworker um, that will support or report rather a suspicious email. Uh, ticket will come in from our help desk. Um, seeking guidance because they get an email. It looks like it could be suspicious, but it might also be legitimate. It's just so hard to tell anymore. Uh, and really the people that do fishing um, have evolved a lot. They've gotten a lot better at what they do. Uh, and sometimes I've seen things that are perfectly legitimate that look less realistic than, than real messages. Um, so we're going to start by uh, looking at message headers and sort of just a quick note on email. Really, if you think of it, Fundamentally, it's just a really long text file, and at the top you've got email headers that has your routing and handling information, and then sort of the bottom part of that is really the body of the message, and that has uh, plain text, code, most notably HTML, JavaScript, uh, and then also you'll have embedded files and attachments, which are really just base64 coded versions of those files. And Outlook is one of the prevalent email clients used in enterprises um, most everywhere. Very popular. So Microsoft doesn't make it easy necessarily to find the headers. Um, so when you look in the toolbar, uh, you'll see the expander icon to the right of tags. You can click on that. And from there, um, you can also go to the file menu. There's more than one way to do this. and from there, you'll have the properties button. Either way, we'll get into the message headers. Uh, again, sort of in line with they don't make it easy to get to this stuff. This is what the message headers sort of look like. It's very hard to see in this very small window. Uh, fortunately, you can click in there, do a control A, control C to copy it and paste it in your editor of choice. Highly recommend doing that. It makes it a whole lot easier than trying to view things in this little tiny window that they give you that you can't really resize. So some other email clients, um, Mozilla Thunderbird is pretty popular. Um, it's the one I'm going to show in the demo. But uh, you would go to the options menu, view, and select headers and all. Or optionally, you could go to the more menu and click on the source option. So there are a lot of email clients out there, different email clients, including some webmail-based clients. Uh, fortunately, MX Toolbox, which I'm going to touch on a little bit later, they make it very simple for you to hop on and um, find instructions for your specific email client, including webmail clients. Uh, the one thing that's still really 
difficult is if the email comes in and the recipient really only has access to a mobile mail client. Uh, unfortunately, they don't really make those so that you can even really get in to see what the headers are, which is the juicy stuff we're going to talk about in a little bit. So the other part of it I talked about with headers being the first part, the message body, um, that is the source of the message. And so a lot of times you can right click in the body of the message anywhere there's white space and then select view source. But sometimes um, enterprising uh, marketers will disable that using JavaScript, um, something along those lines. Fortunately, you can always get to it by going to the actions menu. And once you get to the actions menu, select the option to uh, view source and then you'll actually be able to see the text of the message. Um, so I'm going to pull up a uh, sample phishing email here and uh, we'll talk about these things. And so what we want to do is begin, begin by inspecting the message headers for clues and inspecting the email message source code for clues and traps uh, and then inspect attachments for more potential traps. Um, so with that, I'm going to break out of the slide here if I can and uh, pull up a uh, sample phishing message. Bear with me one moment. Let me go ahead and drag it over here to the uh, other screen. All right, let me see if I can make that a little bigger, make it a little easier to see for everyone. So this is a uh, sample phishing email message I crafted. Um, I actually just crafted it late last night. Um, this is very much indeed uh, fresh fish. Um, the, so the interesting thing about this particular email message is there's really nothing uh, inherently nefarious about the message itself. Um, it, uh, I've spoofed the header information, so you'll see things uh, in terms of the, uh, the from field, subject field, and the to field. Uh, they've all been, been modified, uh, but I actually did send this through real mail services. Um, but this is pretty emblematic of some of the things that you see in the real world. Um, and this is sort of a lot of soft cells throughout here. So a lot of what you see in this message it's not really a whole lot of, hey, open up this attachment and click here and putting it in bold letters and really making it stand out. Actually, we're just kind of burying it and we're sort of incorporating a bunch of soft sale marketing fluff in there that's the kind of stuff you get in real email messages when you, when you get bills and so forth and they, they pad in a bunch of other stuff. Um, the other things that will sell this is that that's a real number for Verizon. That's really their sales number. That's a real address that they own. Um, so I've actually seen these where people will definitely use the real world information to sell it as legitimate when in fact it's just completely fictionalized uh, for their purposes. Um, and again, there is nothing malicious at all in this email. It's the same as any other email. This is not something that's going to get caught by spam filters. Um, generally speaking, um, the interesting thing about the domain name, um, now this was actually treated as possibly suspicious when I received it because at Verizon businessmail.com is not really a registered domain. It's just one I made up and that's something that the fishers will do. Um, now sometimes your mail filters may catch this because that domain doesn't actually exist. Nobody's registered it, but through namecheap.com or any other registrar you like, for about $11, you could register this domain. Um, and then you can let it bake for you know over a month, six months, a year, however long you want. And then from there, you can send it out. Because what some filters will do is they'll look at the age of a domain. And if it's a fresh domain, they'll block it or flag it as highly suspicious. Um, but absolutely, um, threat actors will sit on these things. The other thing that they'll do is there are actually websites where they will look for expiring domains. That is domains that are about ready to expire. And when they lapse, they'll quickly jump in, 
register those domains. Now, all of a sudden, the age of this domain may look like it's been around for 10 years. It's just that it was taken over by somebody. It was essentially abandoned uh, by whoever owned it beforehand. Uh, and again, your filters are not really going to trip on that. And uh, the other thing is, once they register a domain, the other th another thing is if they register this domain and they configure DNS and they set their SPF record as a, in the TXT records, uh, SPF pointer, and they include whatever IP ranges they're going to send it from, uh, that's another thing. It's just going to outright um, essentially tell the internet that, yeah, it's cool if this particular IP address where it's this compromised host is sending emails this domain. Um, and chances are, if it's a registered domain, it's been around for a little bit, and there's a DNS TXT record that matches the origin of where this message came from, it's going to get through. There's nothing to prevent it. Um, so you can see here, there's actually an attachment. Uh, it's a PDF attachment. So we'll go ahead and open it up and show you guys what this looks like. And so this is, uh, again, very representative of the kinds of things that you'll see. Um, again, there's nothing really, you know, there is a, a thing saying your invoice is ready. You can see the info uh, graphic. And for anybody that uses Gmail, you'll readily recognize that this is the same icon you get when somebody will send you an attachment. You can either download it or open it up in Google Drive. So you definitely have those options um, and again, it's meant to look like a statement. The trick is, though, it's not really a document share in this case. Um, it's really, if, if I do a mouse over, you can see it's going to a bit.ly address. And we're going to talk about that here in a moment. Um, so let me quickly go ahead and close out of here. And we'll go back to the email. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, actually open up the uh, text version of this. And we'll take a quick look at the header information and just kind of walk through that real quick. <coughs> All right, so... Go ahead and start at the top here. Um, usually the stuff at the top is really just sort of your internal mail routing. Uh, you might want to look at there just to make sure that things do make sense, um, that they really are coming in on your standard mail servers. Uh, if it's coming from an internal host and you think there should be no mail service on there, uh, again, that should be a red flag. It's something that's potentially suspicious and definitely something you want to look at. Um, the other things, just kind of going through here, you'll see timestamp information, um, and so on. Um, really, the good stuff here is, uh, um, again, you can see when I tested this that uh, the uh, IP address is uh, something that, you know, was, was allowed. Now, again, these are, are actually forged headers. Um, I actually used a real IP address in a different country that was actually reportedly sending out spam, uh, mal spam. Um, so... But those are the kinds of things you'll definitely see um, you know, in terms of you know, the validation. And I talked about looking at those SPF pointers and making sure they actually make sense when you're uh, looking up DNS information. Um, you know, again, just some basic from stuff here. Um, my home box is not actually really Poen server. Uh, again, I've changed that. Um, again, this IP address, real world phishing um, stuff going out from that last night. If nobody's addressed it, could even still be happening this moment, hard to say. Um, and this is just the basic header information you get um, and the rest of that. Um, but really, this where it's received from, this is, this is really what you want to hone in on because uh, this is actually the source of the message. And we'll talk about later places you can go to kind of look up that information and uh, you know, sort of see if you can correlate that uh, against you know what you're what you're looking through. Um, we'll just uh, go through the rest of this here. Um, now we get into the body of the message. And one thing I like to do is just uh, if I get something, oops, 
I'll search on HTTP in the message source to try to understand where the bits of this email are coming from. Um, and again, this is going to check out because this is actually a real Verizon site. And you better believe that the threat actors are out there crawling sites. They're looking for legitimate web pages to link through because that's going to further sell it to somebody saying, hey, this is definitely a legitimate email message. Uh, from here, we'll go ahead and just kind of going through. Um, next one's kind of the same thing. Um, again, these... Uh, Website addresses, definitely fine. We're looking at some of the uh, rest of the source here. All of a sudden, whoa, now this is, this is kind of interesting. So this is some of the infographics that you see coming through here. Anybody notice anything funny about that domain? Yeah, Russian domain. Anybody think Verizon is headquartered in Russia? That that's where you would get your invoices from? I would challenge that probably not. So this is kind of a dead giveaway that when you look at these things to understand that, yeah, this is actually using scraped content to serve up images and usually to keep the emails lightweight so they can blast them out and uh, raise less red flags from where they're going out from. They'll usually link to infographics that are hosted elsewhere on the, online. Um, and so those are the, the kinds of trips or tricks that you want to look at. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and go back to the attachment. Uh, we looked at that earlier. One thing you can do with the PDF, rather than outright opening it up, I don't generally recommend uh, doing that straight off the bat if you're investigating something. Actually open it up in a text editor, um, and it's going to be unhappy with the content. Um, you know, We're going to tell it to edit anyway. And same thing, so I search for HTTPS just so I can find either things that are HTTP or HTTPS enabled. This is a much better way than actually opening up the attachment to understand where it's actually going. Um, and from here you can understand it's actually a uh, link going out somewhere. Now Bitly is one of these services, it's a URL shortener service. It's used a lot legitimately by a lot of big companies, but it's also used by threat actors for nefarious purposes. Uh, it's one of those things it's hard to just block it outright because so many companies and so many organizations use it. Um, but that's a way you can tell um, essentially where this is going um, before you look at it. And you can also try to find more. In this case, we're just getting the one hit. So it's really only the one link. Um, but don't stop when you get to the first hit. Keep going to see where the other things are, are you know, basically referenced uh, online. So that way, when you're conducting your investigations, you have a uh, understanding of, of where all this, where this is all going. And we'll talk about a little bit where that actually really is going here. Let me uh, see if I can pick back up here. All right, so some tools to use as we do our investigations, and I've tried to tailor this to where you do not need a dedicated sandbox environment. It's awesome if you have one. There is nothing better than if you have a dedicated sandbox environment that you can actually go to and uh, basically detonate these things and see what they're doing with, without risking any harm back into your real production environment. Not everybody's so fortunate um, in their investigations. Uh, those you know, sort of test environments cost money. They take infrastructure, they take people to manage them. You have to do a lot of things to make sure they're very isolated. Uh, it gets a little tricky. Uh, but here's some things you can absolutely use um, without any of that. You can use URL expanders, and we'll talk about that here in a moment, that bit.ly example I showed you. Uh, you can use online web page scanners, such as VirusTotal. Um, there's another one I reference as well. Uh, you can use an image file uh, converter uh, so I talked about opening up the PDF in a text editor of choice. That doesn't really tell you what it looks like. You don't really understand from that what the attachment actually looked like. You don't understand the constructs of what the, the fish was. You understand where it's going, and you'll understand where the payload is. That's something you can actually use to essentially strip out that coding. We'll touch on that here in a moment. Um, you can also use a website screenshot generator. Uh, again, extremely helpful to understand where these things are going. Uh, there's online website source code viewers, uh, decoders, and then finally we'll wrap up with who is engines and abuse contacts. And uh, we'll also just kind of touch on file scanners uh, for attachment files. 
Um, so you are all expander. Uh, again, demoed the Bitly address that was in there earlier. Um, so there's any number of these. Uh, the one I referenced was checkshorturl.com, but if you just Google search URL expander, you'll find any other number of competing ones if a site's down or becomes unavailable or whatever. There's plenty more. Uh, the cool thing is you load up the page, you punch in the uh, shortened URL, it spits back after processing it a little bit, the uh, expanded URL. So you can actually understand now where this bit.ly address that was hidden, where it's actually ending up and where it's actually going. Uh, online web page scanners. Um, so virustotal.com is, is one that is... Uh, probably one of the better known, you can actually not just do it for file analysis, you can actually punch in uh, website addresses and have it scan and analyze the landing page and tell you if it's, a, if it's uh, finding any malicious content or not. Um, and VirusTotal, it's, uh, you know, it, it uses a lot of scanners at one time. It's not just married to any one particular product, which is good um, because you want as many um, different uh, technologies looking at that as you can get. And... Uh, it's kind of a one-stop shop, works great. Uh, it's now owned by Google, and, you know, again, it also will scan files, but uh, definitely uh, use it for web pages if you're not already when you're investigating these things. Um, so, you know, again, we talked about looking at the PDF source code. It doesn't really tell you what it looks like. Um, so one thing you can do is you can actually find an online image to file converter. Uh, again, what this will do is this will basically strip out all the coding that's inside of the file and just present you with a screen grab of what it looked like. Now you can take this bitly encoded address, see the button that's, you know, hey, click here to download your invoice, and completely understand now exactly where that's going or what that looked like. So you understand how it is they're trying to sell the fish uh, to whoever they've targeted. Um, Quick note here, never upload anything that you have a high degree of certainty is, is going to have confidential information, PII type of stuff, because if you're uploading it to the internet, public facing somewhere, chances are everybody else can get to it as well. You would not want to have sensitive information leaked out because you decided to upload this thing to an image converter. At this point, you should have a pretty high degree of certainty that this is not going to contain suspicious or confidential information and that it probably really is coming from from somewhere nefarious. Um, website uh, screenshot generator. Um, so screenshotmachine.com is one that I like. Uh, there's more. You can just Google search for online website screenshot generator. And what this does is this actually takes that full URL that we extracted using our URL expander and it shows us what the page looked like. And what's great about this is we can go there and see what this page looked like without actually having to visit it. We're not using our own browser to potentially expose it to an exploit kit that uh, by visiting the site, but at the same time, we can understand what that page looks like on the back end. Uh, again, it's kind of a poor man's sandbox, but it's absolutely effective and uh, it does work well. Um, that sort of dovetails nicely into uh, website uh, source code viewer, and we'll touch on this uh, as well. This will actually let you view the page source um, again without actually having to visit the page yourself and expose your own environment to something that could potentially host malicious content. Um, and you definitely get good information out of this. Uh, you kind of have to look at the code a little bit sometimes to understand what they're doing. Um, sometimes you can just kind of best guess it if you don't have a lot of threat analytic experience. Uh, but you can usually have a pretty good idea of roughly of what's like this page might be downloading a, uh, a downloader file or something on the system. Uh, that's what it's trying to do, even if you don't understand exactly what the executable is, exactly where it's pulling it from, because they'll definitely do things to obfuscate the code. And, and again, we'll definitely touch on that in a moment here as well. So decoders uh, is something that... Uh, had to use a little bit more. Um, sometimes you, you do find content on web pages, um, sometimes even in the email itself, uh, but usually, uh, usually on the, uh, on the websites. And so sometimes you might need to decode content. It's not always going to be base 64. That's just a, a quick example. Uh, but if you have a good idea what the encoding scheme is, you can definitely try to find a, uh, online, uh, decoder to help you understand what that is. Uh, in some cases, yes. Uh, 
You know, I have not. That's a great question. So the question was if I found a great um, encoding um, schema identifier. Um, that's something I'll definitely have to look into, though. That's a great suggestion. Uh, I wish I had a, a recommendation. Right now I don't. I'll have to look into it. So once we actually understand sort of what's happening, uh, we want to take a look at the uh, who is engines to uh, understand who our abuse contacts are. Um, and so there are different uh, internet registries, uh, regional inter internet registries that have their own who is, depending on where the IP address is. Um, for the domains themselves, uh, ICANN has a great lookup. So if you want to understand who owns the domain where that landing page is, you can try to get their WHOIS information. It's a little trickier now because a lot of places are using privacy, domain uh, registration with privacy settings. Uh, hopefully they have that set up correctly. What I've found um, before working in security, I worked as a system admin and um, did a lot of email administration, did a lot of stuff for a hosting company. Um, unfortunately, what I found is that a lot of um, domains don't actually, they're not actually monitoring where they have their privacy controls set to point to. Uh, it's sort of, it can be a point of frustration, but uh, you know, it's definitely worth worth trying and, and we'll, we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, and then it, if you essentially use some of the network tools we're gonna talk about a little bit to understand the IP address where that landing page is, uh, you can understand who then the abuse contact is in those records. So some additional tools and, and resources. Uh, we talked about DNS records, um, and uh, we're going to uh, you know, talk about some of the sites down below. So uh, locally on your own system, you're going to have NS lookup almost regardless of operating system. That's kind of a universal one. Uh, a lot of your Linux, Unix-based OSs will also support DIG, uh, which can give you a little bit more sometimes. Uh, both of those are perfectly good. Um, if uh, you're just getting started in this stuff, there's definitely some websites that are devoted to uh, working with this, including uh, DomainTools.com, NetworkTools.com. There are others. Uh, this is not a comprehensive, all-inclusive list, um, but uh, those are a couple good ones that I've used. Uh, MX Toolbox is really a great one as well. Uh, it goes in line with those other ones. Well, the reason I break that off separately is they have a great blacklist check. So that lets you put in the IP address for a mail server. Remember we talked about the headers and how to understand the mail server where the message originated from. You can actually punch that in and it checks uh, multiple real-time block lists to see if this has been reported as sending out spam. Um, and that is extremely helpful in troubleshooting. So uh, also a very honorable mention for spamcop.net. Um, so a lot of what we talked about and what I've demoed is how to sort of do this stuff by hand. Um, the nice thing with spamcop.net is it's a free service. I think they have a, a paid option that gets rid of a nag window, uh, but it's definitely worth using. And I think even the, the paid version is very nominal fee. You know, uh, I think they advertise about $15 for about two years worth of use on average. Uh, Quite a bargain, really. Uh, the nice thing is what this will do is this will actually parse your he email header information. You literally just copy and paste the headers in and the message source code in, and it'll actually crunch that down for you. It'll do the lookups um, for you to understand who's hosting the information, where it came from, what the links are using, where those abuse contacts are, and it just gives you a nice, easy one-stop shop to um, automate that quite a bit. One thing I do recommend doing, though, is uh, don't just rely on that. Actually, look at it yourself first if you have time and try to understand as much as that as you can before you actually run it through SpamCop. That's one way to get really good at this uh, finding and reporting um, spam messages. Um, definitely, definitely check out SpamCop if you haven't already, if you're not familiar with it. So you definitely always have to beware of gotchas, uh, and this is this is pretty huge. Um, we talked about certainly at length the obfuscation by URL shortener. Um, better believe they absolutely use that. Uh, they don't really so much want you to understand where the actual landing page is, um, and then there is evasion code. 
so if you remember, I talked about the online source code generator. Um, again, you don't have to be a web developer always to understand what's going on. Uh, I looked at the uh, code for one page. I had a screen grab of it. it. looked like just a generic 404. It's like, okay, either what was there has gone away, it's gotten cleaned up, or it's, you know, the service is shut down. Something's happened where this is not being permitted anymore. And I thought that until I looked at the source code for the web page using an online source code viewer. And what it was doing is it was actually using uh, code in there to check the user agent string for the browser. And if it wasn't one of the popular browsers, you know, Google Chrome, Internet Explorer, Microsoft Edge, Apple Safari, Mozilla Firefox, if it wasn't using any of the big browsers, it would present that 404 page. If it detected that it was actually using one of those browsers, it would actually redirect to another page on that same server. And so what I was able to do then is understand it was a relative path, but I already had the full path. So I was able to get a screen grab of the relative path and understand where it was actually going to. And that was extremely crucial in realizing this is still a live thread, it's still out there. But if I was relying completely on my screen grab, I never would have known uh, what they were doing. Uh, so that's pretty smart for the attackers. Uh, I've heard a lot that, you know, sometimes phishing isn't so sophisticated, but, uh, you know, those are, those are pretty clever techniques, if you ask me, to try to deliver a payload. Um, iframes are another one. So you can definitely go out to a page, and it's not really the page that's being served up. It's just the shell, and really the payload is actually buried inside the actual URL that's being served up as an iframe. And when you're using your screen capture tool, you don't understand that that's not really, yeah, that's, it's been, it's been compromised. It's being leveraged, but that's not really where the payload is. The payload is actually somewhere else. Um, and then redirects and forwards, sort of the same thing. You'll see a lot of, uh, redirect, you know, 301 redirects, HTTP meta refresh redirects, all manner of redirects to, send something when somebody goes to this page onto the next site. Um, and it's very similar to running into the iframes. Um, and coded content, one of the reasons I had to add decoder stuff to the slide deck is I've actually seen that. Um, and I'm going to touch on that here again in just one moment. So uh, because of all the little gotchas here, never rely too heavily on your um, defense defenses and your tools. Uh, and you'll definitely see why here in a moment. Um, but, uh, yeah, I've actually seen, uh, recently, um, a phishing email come through and it had the, uh, the text and it had the URL. It was actually going to a web page. It was using an HTTP meta refresh to redirect the traffic to yet another domain also out of the country. That page was actually using the iframe to then serve up content from yet a third domain also outside of the country. And then while I'm looking at the source code for that, I'm looking at it and think, that's, that looks like Unicode. Uh, again, I wish I had an automated one, but, you know, I took a chance, so I found a decoder. Sure enough, decoded it. And guess what? Inside of the Unicode, they had a base 64 encoding con, or encoded content inside of there. So that somebody went through a heck of a lot of trouble to really create a heck of a trail to understand exactly what it's doing. And it turns out it's an Office 365 credential harvesting site. Um, but uh, yeah, again, somebody went to a lot of work. And the thing that you'll you'll notice that I'm going to touch on here in a moment is that um, a lot of this stuff defeats the current technology that we have in place. Uh, and I didn't necessarily invent the technique I'm going to talk about here in a moment, but uh, really it was being exploited by the threat actors. And I just happened to ask the question, how is this getting through our stuff? We have best-in-class products. We have tight security controls. Uh, we have great policies in place. And yet it's defeating everything that we have, all the defense in-depth layers that we have in place. And that's why, because things just don't scan that many levels deep. Sometimes it almost takes a human to actually look at these things to understand you know, you go down the rabbit hole. And by the way, this isn't uh, just sort of a start at the top and go all the way to the bottom. Sometimes you have to, you get to the top, you end up in the middle, you have to go back to the top again because they'll just keep looping these these different techniques through. Uh, and sometimes it can take a while to go down that rabbit hole and understand where this stuff is coming from. 
Um, so we talked about uh, attachment file scanners. Uh, again, VirusTotal is a very good one. Um, and again, files, URLs, works great. Um, Javi Malware Scan um, doesn't have quite as many scan engines, but it's another source. Uh, again, I always like getting those second opinions. That's definitely a good place to uh, also scan stuff. I often leverage them both. Uh, I haven't looked at them for a while. Um, used to be there were some differences between the two in terms of what engines they had. I don't know if um, Jotty still has something that's exclusive to them that VirusTotal doesn't have, but uh, uh, again, um, you never know when you're scanning something what definitions are for each of those scanners. Good idea to get that second opinion. Um, and I'm throwing in malware, which is M-A-L-W-R dot com for free sandbox analysis. Uh, that one's kind of, it's great. It uh, will actually detonate your files for you and give you a lot of great insight. One of the challenges, though, it's kind of a hobby site. It's not really commercially supported by anyone. It's essentially run by folks on their spare time. It's often down. It uh, doesn't always work. But give it a shot. Your mileage may vary. Um, and again, just another note. If it's something that's going to potentially have sensitive information, don't upload it. Um, and so we talked about the phishing message that I created, and to show you how effective that is, I, you know, again, it's an email, nothing wrong with the email, it's got an attachment, there's nothing, there's no actual payload in the attachment itself, that's one of the reasons it passes everything, but it actually points to a URL that actually has the malicious content. Um, so I run it through the Jotty Malware scan, and as you can see, this is the EML file, the email. Zero out of 16 scanners detected it. You think, well, VirusTotal will give you a whole lot more than that. So I ran it through VirusTotal. And guess what happened? Zero through 59 detects it. Some of you might be thinking, well, that's because it's in the email. That's another layer. If you took that layer out, I bet you it finds it in the attachment. Well, okay, I'll scan just the attachment by itself. This is the PDF file with the link that goes to a eventually a malicious page. Jotty malware scan, again, zero out of 16 scanners detects it. Virus total, this time zero out of 60. There are some scanners that couldn't handle the EML file. Uh, more of them could handle the PDF. Nothing detected it. We showed the uh, full URL earlier. Let's take a look at that. Um, here's the actual landing page. If I actually scan the actual landing page itself without these layers, you can see it detected 8 out of 67. And a quick note about when you're scanning files, uh, you understand that when you have a, a real positive hit, it's not going to trigger on all of them or even the majority of them. With URLs, it's even less so. If you're scanning a URL using VirusTotal and you see one positive hit, there's a good chance there really is malicious content out there. If you see on two or more, you can almost bet a chicken dinner that it's got something malicious about it. So this is the actual landing page, and again, you can see when we scan it by itself, virus Toad already knows about it. It's definitely getting heavily flagged. Um, and, you know, again, the only difference here is just how we delivered it. And some pen testers um, sort of say, well, don't use attachments because stuff gets flagged, it gets caught. Um, and that might be true if you actually have malicious payload directly in the attachment. But I tell you what, if you're linking to a web source on it, it's probably going to go right through. So I've been playing with this for a little bit over a year. Uh, actually sat in a, a webinar is around September, October time frame. Uh, Crane Hazeld with uh, Fish Labs. Uh, he actually demoed this and they refer to it as DocuFish. A lot of times these are things that link to fake document sharing services or document signing services. Um, and it was something that was, you know, you see things run in iterations and uh, for a little while that was pretty popular. Um, and so, as you've seen firsthand from the screen grabs and so forth, the attack technique is highly effective at defeating our best-in-class security products, best practices, technical controls to reach inboxes across the enterprise. Uh, and again, it defeats defense in-depth, AV, anti-malware, all the firewalls, secure email gateways we have in place, inline URL sandboxing. Um, but really, our, our end game here is to uh, determine where the, the final landing page actually is. Um, some of the best methods for dealing with it. 
um, our prevention. Unfortunately, the prevention methods are extremely tough. Uh, things like 100% pure email sandboxing, completely stripping out attachments from all email messages, and not allowing external email at any any level. Uh, appetite to do that in most organizations is extremely low uh, because most people like their email and they don't like things that impede their ability to get email. Uh, <clears throat> So it's not all necessarily uh, doom and gloom, even though we've seen how easy it is to defeat those things. Um, what we want to do is block discovered bad domains and IP addresses still. Uh, we should definitely be doing things around threat intelligence and, and actioning on those. Um, user education is still going to remain key. Uh, sometimes it feels like an exercise in futility, but uh, you know it, it's no reason to just throw in the towel and say, well, people are just going to click the links and we should just give up. Uh, that's not, not an answer that any of us should really settle for. Uh, even though I, I feel your pain, it feels like it at times. Um, using uh, real-time block lists and threat feeds um, to basically uh, manage these things. Again, I talked about reporting as well. Um, the reward that you get for reporting most of this stuff is expect to be ignored. Uh, the sad reality is I've reported a lot of stuff and very rarely do I actually get feedback saying, hey, we investigated it, we took action on it, um, but you know, don't give up, you know, do, do your part, and if somebody else drops the ball from there, there's not much you can do about that, but at least you tried, and, uh, you know, because if these things don't get shut down, they just keep spawning every place else. I mean, I know it's kind of whack-a-mole, but, uh, you know, I, I think it's definitely worth trying to fight and not just give up on the on the struggle to keep the stuff out of our inboxes. Uh, and in lieu of being able to prevent what's coming in sometimes, uh, monitor what's going out. Uh, and be be mindful looking at that. So when you're trying to do an investigation as well, just some final tips for you. Um, if you're really not sure, sometimes you look at it, you go through all the steps, and you think, I just don't know. There's something that makes me think this may not be real, or there's something that, yeah, it looks weird, but I have a feeling if, if this is real and we don't act on it, um, it could be problems. You know, contact the person who presumably sent out the message, give them a phone call. Hey, I got this email from you. I'm not quite sure what to, to make of it. Did you intentionally send this to me? Yeah, okay. Okay, it's probably probably good. Um, if it's somebody internal, go stop by their desk um, and ask them, hey, I got this email from you. Did you want me to act on this? Yeah, okay. You, know, you find out quickly. If the answer is no, then you, you know there's definitely something suspicious. Um, you can instant message a person uh, if they work in the same company, maybe not directly on site. Uh, you can also email the person directly. You just have to beware that when you email somebody saying, hey, did you send me this funny looking email? The person that replies back may be somebody that's compromised that email account. So the person that replies back and says, yeah, absolutely, I sent that to you. Be sure to open it. That may not be who you really think it is, uh, which is why the other methods are, are probably a little more effective. So. Uh, I probably mostly about run us out of time. If there's a quick question, uh, be happy to take one. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. So uh, when you're defining this, have you been turning this um, as a discussion mostly around what you as an individual can do in terms of protecting yourself, or, you can, or, or is your mindset more of you need a tool to protect me with uh, uh, an engineer at a company that can um, work in that area? Which one is Sure. Yeah, the frame of reference of this is definitely as the investigator, somebody doing digital forensic incident response type of work. Um, if uh, going back to that user education point, though, this is why you want to encourage your users. Hey, if you got something, more than happy to take a look at it. Just let us know, and uh, we can take a look at that for you. So, if there are any other questions, uh, I'll be around. Definitely hit me up after the talk. Uh, I'm not going anywhere, so. With that, I've kind of run out of time. Thank you, everybody, for, for coming.